What is going on guys and welcome back to another video with me, Ben Rogjan, aka the Seattle Data Guy. Well, as I just got back from the Snowflake Summit, I feel like it's only appropriate that I do a video about Databricks. So the focus of this video is to answer the question, what is Databricks and why do people use it? When you look at the fact that Databricks is recording $800 million of revenue in 2021, it's got to make you stop and wonder where in the world are they going to grow to next? And since there have been a few times that Databricks has essentially passed the value of a snowflake based on their VC funding and valuation, it makes you wonder which tool is going to win out in this battle of what people are calling data lake houses. Now, arguably, that whole concept, I think, was brought out a little bit more from Databricks, but both solutions are trying to sell themselves as data platforms and not just, you know, a data lake or not just, you know, a data warehouse on the cloud. They want you to know that they are so much more. So let's dive into Databricks. Now, Databricks itself wasn't started till about 2013, but much of the development into Spark itself happened far prior. Um, there's actually a few research papers you can pick up, including one on resilient data sets, which is kind of the focus or kind of what Spark is developed around. Um, it's basically processing in what you're often going to hear is RDDs. Um, I'm going to put up the paper here as well as link for anyone who's interested in learning more. But basically, it was developed by um, some professors at UC Berkeley. And eventually, like anything else that is difficult to manage, people eventually wanted an option for managed Spark services. If you're familiar with AWS EMR or uh, GCP's uh, Dataproc, that's essentially what you could do. You could set up Spark jobs um, using those managed services. But what if you went a few steps further? That's where Databricks comes in. Databricks is not just one open source solution, but in fact, it's multiple. Uh, at its core, in particular, it's Spark, Delta Lake, and MLflow. In particular, Spark is pretty much unavoidable. You're going to use it whenever you're processing data. Um, Delta Lake can set up uh, Delta tables. So that's something that we can dive into in a second video. And MLflow, again, is more of an option. Uh, for those of you who haven't worked with MLflow, it's basically going to take a lot of those questions you have if you're a data scientist. In terms of how do I deploy this model, um, that's going to be your answer for a lot of people. Uh, it's going to take care of like model registry, model deployment, uh, some model monitoring, um, a lot of these things that we don't always know what to do with, right? Like you're like, I've developed a model. Now, what do I do with it? Um, MLflow is one option. Uh, another option you might have heard of is Kubeflow. So MLflow is what Databricks uses, uh, as well as, again, Delta Lake and Spark. But again, most people are going to most likely interact with the Spark layer mostly, but in a way that is very friendly for any data scientist or data engineer because they've set it up in such a way that if you're familiar with Jupyter Notebooks, you're going to do great. So let's just dive into Spark really lightly so you can kind of understand what it is, what it's doing, and what's the whole focus? You know, what is an RDD? So Apache Spark was started in 2009 at UC Berkeley at AMP Labs with the goal of balancing uh, fault tolerance and scalability that often you find with Hadoop in a solution. And the goal of Spark was to balance the fault tolerance uh, and scalability of Hadoop while also providing that ability to essentially reuse sets of data across multiple processes. Now, I think it would be a miss if I didn't go over data lake houses because clearly uh, Databricks has decided to bet uh, on this horse. And basically every ad I've ever seen um, for Databricks is often poking fun at the concept of a data warehouse because what they are viewing in terms of the future of development and data management isn't a data warehouse, but instead a data lake. And both Snowflake and Databricks have their definitions in terms of what is a data lake house. If you ask Snowflake what is a data lake house, they're going to define it again as a combination of data warehouse and a data lake and trying to find the benefits of both. You know, the cost effectiveness of a data lake with the data management kind of benefits that you get in a data warehouse, things like security and just clear table uh, structures that make it easy for analysts and future developers to actually approach the data and it's not just a bunch of files that you know someone's gonna have to figure out what exists where one thing i do think is interesting is snowflake does seem to try to push more towards the data science use case um, for data lake houses whereas you know 
uh, databricks is clearly saying this is everything this is sql this is business intelligence this is real-time analytics you know that's kind of the difference that they're trying to sell here my personal impression of databricks which is again trying to sell more of this data lake house um, architecture is that it really is geared heavily towards data scientists it's not to say that it's not built for data engineers but there's definitely you know, with everything being focused mostly around notebooks, and we're gonna talk about some of the different features that they offer, but mostly around notebooks, that's just so quintessential to most uh, data scientists that that's the feeling I get. There are other things you're gonna learn about, such as jobs, such as uh, how you can actually structure uh, tables and stream things directly from like your Kafka instances that do start playing into this whole micro batch streaming uh, batch ETL processes that are very familiar to any data engineer. Uh, so if we dive into Databricks, and I'm gonna just show the kind of key components you're gonna work with in Databricks, and then we're gonna dive right into Databricks, but all of these components are essentially the core tools you're gonna use when you go into Databricks. So what you're gonna have to get used to is the concept of workspaces, notebooks, tables, uh, jobs, clusters, and libraries. There's a few other kind of components, but I think those are the main ones um, that if you're a user, you have to become familiar with. Tables are interesting because it's, it's kind of this abstraction of often files, but in many ways, that's all tables are uh, in a lot of our modern um, architecture anyways, where there's just kind of the difference between a table and, and a file is, is diminishing and, and schema is really becoming more and more on read, um, even in, in the Snowflake world. So let's dive into Databricks itself. So diving into Databricks UI, uh, we're gonna go into some of the different components that I referenced earlier. Um, workspaces, I think is decently self-explanatory. This is gonna be the space that you work. You can either be a specific user or you can create a shared workspace. So if you have a team, you can create the shared workspace or if you're just by yourself, you can create a user workspace. Next, you can kind of see a lot of what you can do in Databricks using the create button. So the create button basically lets you see that you can create notebooks, tables, clusters, jobs, and a repo. Clusters, generally pretty self-explanatory if you understand Spark. Basically, it's the amount of compute, essentially, you can think about it as that you're going to select in terms of how many workers you're gonna have, in terms of how large the machine is that you're gonna use. So for example here, you know, if I create a test, um, you know, you can have a standard machine. You can also uh, work in terms of either having single node or high concurrency. You can then select your Spark version. So more than likely you wanna pick uh, whatever Spark at the time is fully supported. And from there you can pick how big your machine's going to be. Uh, obviously the larger your machine, the, the more data you're processing, the more expensive it's going to get. So for now, you know, keep it as small as possible. You can also set it to terminate after inactivity, which is great. Uh, again, trying to reduce costs if you're not using your machine. And then from there you can just create cluster. And then in the future, as you're like developing uh, different notebooks or jobs, you can tell it to point to different clusters um, kind of as you go along. Next, let's go over tables. So this is kind of what it sounds like a little bit. Um, the interesting thing here is that you are going to be dealing with tables at the abstraction of almost pretty much a file, which essentially is in a data lake or a data lake house, kind of the context in which you do deal with tables anyways. But it really kind of, I think, makes it very clear that that's where you're dealing with things here. So you can either just upload a raw file, like a CSV here, or you can pick a data source. So you can pick something like Azure Blob Storage. Um, you could do S3 if you're using um, AWS, but I'm using Azure. Uh, you can pick Kafka. And from here, you can actually create a notebook to see how it will import said table. Now with tables, it's important to understand that there's different uh, abstractions of tables. Some can be external, some can be internal, um, some can be backed by Delta. Delta tables gives you um, a lot of the benefits of like acid transactions and things of that nature, whereas uh, normal tables will not. And there's also, again, more to do in terms of like internally, externally managed. And I'll put up a quick chart here to show all the differences between different types of tables in Databricks. Once you've created a cluster and a table, you can more than likely now go into notebooks and create some sort of notebook. And the great thing about Databricks is it gives you a few options in terms of what type of uh, coding language you're gonna use in your notebook. You can use Python, Scala, uh, SQL, or R. So let's just do R test. Yeah, let's just do R test. So we're gonna just create this on this cluster that I have, and this will create a notebook that you can work on. And here's where things get even better is a lot of data scientists often wonder, how do I actually you know, put those notebooks into production? And it's ready for production. You can go to create, you can hit create, hit job. And now you can actually take that notebook and make a job. So if we go here, whatever we can call this, 
R test task. Uh, we can select the notebook by going to my users, R test confirm. Uh, from here, we can just hit create. And what you'll see here is that it not only lets you kind of create this task, but you can create more by hitting this plus button, which will then, if you hit plus, create a dependency. So for people who are trying to figure out how to create dependencies or just their general jobs anyways, this is one thing that Databricks will take care of. Not only that, it will let you again hit schedule so you can decide when you actually going to schedule that job. So hit continue scheduled, you can set it to some sort of timing and that can be very helpful. And for people who want to do a more complex set of timing, you can also use cron. You can hit save to schedule that job. You can also then connect with Git. So if you want to, you know, have some form of version control that is also automatically integrated to all of Databricks. Again, this is something that I really do enjoy about the Databricks kind of developer experience is that so much of it is integrated. Um, and I do kind of wish Snowflake was a little more like that where a lot more of your workflow was integrated into one. And you can also swap out whatever configuration of Spark cluster you're using. So if you're deciding that this is no longer sufficient or maybe it's too much um, in terms of uh, cluster size, you can resize that and, and, and fix that. So that's really what's great about jobs. It allows you to basically take a notebook and essentially truly productionize it. All these components are really great because they make data science workflows, I think, much easier to productionize. You know, if you are really comparing Databricks to Snowflake, you're not going to get that in the current setup of Snowflake. And I do think Snowflake's trying to, you know, add more uh, with a lot of their ability to start running Python on your data. But in terms of native functionality, the fact that Databricks used Spark as their underlying processing engine is what gives them this ability to run multiple uh, different languages in terms of uh, jobs and notebooks, as well as gives them this ability to kind of create jobs in, in this way. You do have tasks in Snowflake, but I, I really always kind of wish that those tasks were somehow more like this. Somehow I could actually see them in a UI and create them rather than having a purely SQL based approach. Anyways, guys, this is your intro to Databricks. Uh, if you enjoyed it, let me know in the comments below. Maybe I can start creating a few jobs here if you guys are really liking it. Anyways, I will see you guys next time. Thank you and goodbye.